Sheffield Railwomen's Club, Saturday night. We'd just like to, uh, before we carry on, just like to say that we arrived yesterday, by the way, uh, to make sure we were on time. Not like the British Railway is always late. So I hope we're alive. We'd also like to say that you may think that we're getting a lot of money tonight, but we're not. We're getting a free pass on the railways. So it goes. Yes. They've all got free passes in here, anyway, haven't they? A steam locomotive is the nearest approach a man-made machine will ever be to a human being. Every driver and fireman looks upon this machine as a, a female. He always calls it she, never it, never he. And he has to pander to its whims. And a steam locomotive has whims, more so than what a diesel or an electric has. One's a steam man, all is a steam man. Good. Oh, yeah, that's what nothing to touch him. That's what oh, God says. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, oh, oh you're, you're electric, electric man. Don't. Yes, I've never been on it. But, but uh, steam, there's two, I enjoy There's two or three of us here. We will work steam, electrics and diesel. Yeah. And for the best engine of the lot is the electric. <laughs> Scott leaving Euston in the 1930s when railways were still heroic. They had been heroic since the beginning, since 1825. When they opened a new line and the first train steamed into the first station, they played See the Conquering Hero Comes. The Royal Scott, only a generation ago, was still a conquering hero. And in those days, the railway had its part in many remembered moments. When you parted, it was at Euston or Liverpool Lime Street or Edinburgh Waverley that you said goodbye. People travelled less, but remembered it more. This film is not only about railways, it's also about the men who work on them. In particular, about the men who run, or used to run, two lines in the north of England, where railways were first built. One line, the old Midland line from Birmingham New Street by way of Derby, Belper, Ambergate and Chesterfield to Sheffield. And the former Great Central line from Sheffield, Victoria, across the Pennines by way of Pennistone and Woodhead to Manchester. The hourly Manchester train pulls out from Sheffield for a journey of 41 miles, running across high moors or cutting through them. 
the engineer who designed this line said it would join the East and West Seas. He meant you would be able to sail from the Baltic to a port on the English East Coast, come by rail to Sheffield, then travel his line to Manchester, continue to Liverpool, and there catch the Atlantic packet to New York. And just about here, his Grand Railway began on December the 22nd, 1845, when the first through train on the Sheffield, Ashton under Line and Manchester Railway left Bridgehouses Station. For many years past, the old station has been used as a goods depot, and now they're pulling it down. It was at bridge houses that they had the potato siding, engines must not enter, because the warehouse floor wasn't strong enough to take them, and they would have fallen 30 feet into the road. But five years before the first train ran, the first men on this line were navvies like these, who built it with their picks and shovels. In the 1840s, there were 200,000 of them working all over England, and a tough and rowdy lot they were. In 1841, me core dry breeches I put on. Me core dry breeches I put on to work upon the railway, the railway. I'm weary of the railway. Oh, Paddy works on the railway. In 1842, from Hartlepool, I moved to Crewe and found myself a job to do a working on the railway. I was wearing cord dry breeches, digging ditches, dodging hitches, pulling switches. I was working on the railway. Tunnel building was the hardest task. An artist of the time saw it like this. The most notorious tunnel of all was on the Sheffield-Manchester line at Woodhead where 1,500 men hacked and blasted three miles 20 yards through Milston grit, shale, slate and clay. When he saw the plans, George Stevenson said he would eat the first train through the tunnel. These are the moorland churches where they never went alive, but only to be buried. Their deaths are recorded in the parish registers at Penniston and in the chapel of St. James at Woodhead. They died when falling rock caught them or they fell 600 feet down a ventilating shaft or stood too close to the blasting. John Young, killed on the railway, aged 59. Robert Blackburn, aged 38. John Thorpe, aged 24. And their children died too in the shanty camps. John Henry Newton, aged nine months. And then there was cholera. They suffered cramps, their fingers shriveled, their eyes sank, they turned blue. A doctor from Manchester prescribed port wine as a remedy, and they died. The others, when they saw a load of coffins brought up to Woodhead to supply the expected need, ran away and spread the infection over Lancashire and Cheshire. 28 died in one brief epidemic. The last was Rachel Fuchs, who came to nurse the men on a Friday, was afraid from the first, and died on the Monday. The Navy's greatest memorial is the tunnel they built which was, at the time, the longest in the world. Under steam, it was always quite a task keeping to time. A lot depended on the conditions of the engine, and these varied considerably, much more so than the diesel and electrics. There was probably much more margin for error, let's put it that way, both human and mechanical. With the electrics and dieselization, of course, it was a different world altogether for locomotive men. I think we look back on steam with a small sigh of nostalgia and a great big sigh of relief.
approaching Penniston now. Penniston, I should think, is one of the coldest places in England in the winter. During the snow and frost, conditions can be rough with the electrics, where you get quite a lot of slipping. We have to take great care not to get the resistances of the engine hot. They burn out, the engine is a failure. And that means probably someone got a quite a long walk, possibly the driver. The Midland Line. Now, the Midland was a solid railway, which flourished by carrying coal and iron and by looking after its passengers. In 1872, it admitted third-class passengers to all its trains, not just the slow ones. In 1875, it upholstered all third-class carriages, which was unheard of. The other companies scoffed at first, but then were forced to do the same. The Midland always paid. Leaving Birmingham, the express from Poole and Bournemouth to Sheffield and York. At the controls, Arthur Lindsay, aged 50, 33 years on the railway, basic pay, 19 pounds a week. Ken Morgan, second man, aged 27, basic pay, 14 pounds a week. object is to do time as we term it that is to leave on time and arrive on time and there's nobody fumes more than the driver if he is delayed by signals but even then you have to do your best and abide by it the other week in thick fog and we left pancras on time and arrived at sheffield midland two minutes late which i don't think so bad really in dense fog and waited six minutes outside for signals and arrive eight minutes late. Probably a points failure or something like this. But at least you feel more satisfied when you've got the time. I have had uh, occasions when we were running to Pancras on time and someone's come and said thank you driver and it's really appreciative. Uh, if you're on time probably nobody will speak. If you're a little minute before time they will acknowledge it. If they're late, they all walk by with their heads down to the business. Particularly elderly people will thank you. Old ladies particularly. I don't know whether they look as if I need uh, <laughs> some sort of uh, sympathy. the life you uh, you get about you know meet different people it's not a, a job where you're stuck in one place you know all the time the newspapers have run this job down something terrible that's my own opinion there has never been a true picture put over as to what this job actually involves and the time the apprenticeship more or less what you've got to serve to get into your, you know your top post some of the older drivers, beyond my days, were really... I think they took the place of the jet pilot of today. Uh, they'd gone from the stagecoach to the steam engine, and I think they'd gone from 
the steam engine now to the internal combustion engine and here we're bound to have found a, a deterioration in the glamour of the job, I think. And these people, they were a little tin gods, really, in the old days of time. But I mean, people used to approach you, an engine driver with an oar. Today we approach pilot, so rail lines, I should imagine, in the same manner. This line, the Sheffield Manchester, though it never paid, was the first in the country to be electrified for both passenger and goods trains. The change to overhead electrification started before the war, long before today's intercity electrification out of Euston. Well, left Penniston now on the road to Dumford. That is the eastern end of Woodhead Tunnel. After Peniston, the country is wild, with more sheep than men. It's a place where nothing much has happened since they first built the line. There's still a vague tradition about the cholera epidemic of 1849, only they talk about it as the plague. This is the new Woodhead Tunnel built for the electrification. The old tunnels, which are closed now, had an evil reputation. The train smoke gathered so densely and hung around so long that the gangers maintaining the line often had trouble feeling their way through, even with lamps. Many got silicosis, and some became invalids after as little as six years. It's always been damp and smelly. Railroadmen called it under the hill and said you could get an idea of the tunnel taste by drinking bad port wine and savouring the taste it left in your mouth afterwards. Sometimes the drivers were half suffocated. The footplate was smothered in steam and dirty smoke, and the driver and fireman had to crouch low down to get some breathable air. And I used to try to have a good fire on and keep the smoke down as much as possible because it was terrifying in the tunnel because it hit the chimney and came back onto you. And you couldn't sometimes see your mate at the other side, you know what he was doing. You were sometimes gasping for breath and you were damn glad to get through in anything like reasonable time. And it was terrible to breathe. It was just like breathing carbon. Just like putting your head in a firebox and breathing that. So what we used to do, we used to have a bucket of water on the footplate, have an handkerchief or a white rag, as the company used to give us, dip it in the bucket and wrap it round your mouth, you see, and get in the corner. signal box and signalman Michael Gattenby, age 21. When he left school, he worked in a shop, then a factory, then a mill. But he'd been interested in railways since he was five, and when he was 18, he decided to train as a signalman. His is one of the loneliest boxes on the line, but a busy one. His basic pay is £17.7. .7. One of the most responsible jobs there is, signalman, no doubt about it. Come to think of it, and, uh, it's more important than a pilot. Come to think. I mean, uh, a pilot has got the lives of the people in the plane in his hands. 
the signalman had got the lives of the, say, two passenger trains coming up. Got all those lives. One, one wrong move. There's no, there's no element of mis uh, mistakes in this job. It's a job where you can't make mistakes. Although they do happen, then we've seen the consequences. Uh, come on, controls ringing. Oh, Dad. Oh, David. Uh, Z70 down at 47. Two couple for Penniston at 12.13. That's it. <coughs> down fast just coming out now. You've trained empty in section. <coughs> tell Dunford it's gone. That's a driver ringing in from that train up the up good to tell me that he's arrived. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Yeah. OK. Thank you. See, I can't go before he gives me the tip. The Pool York Express. Keith Foster, aged 40, born in Calcutta, the son of a district signals engineer on the Eastern Bengal Railway. He's been a cleaner, fireman and shunter, but is now a passenger train guard on the Midland run to Sheffield and York. Pay, £15.13. who felt that I'd like to play with a toy train and I've continued playing with them ever since. About four years since, I left it due to all this modernization and what have you because I felt uncertain of my position. But having left it, I had that period of separation for two years from the railway and I felt completely like a fish out of water. Couldn't settle anywhere, had a host of jobs. And uh, till eventually the calling was so strong, you know the old saying of the, uh, you get sawdust in your veins when you work in a circus, the same with the railway. So the calling was strong again. I decided to swallow a bit of pride because believe you me, there's a tremendous amount of pride involved when you have to start back afresh on the railways. But now that I've made the move and I've made the grade in this particular, de in this particular department, I'm not a bit sorry. I'm more, than, uh, I'm, I'm more than satisfied now. I'm a very satisfied man today. <laughs> Dedication to a particular type of industry, uh, uh, that seems to have gone from the railways. You don't get that feeling among youngsters nowadays. They look on the railways as an oddity, a museum piece, something to be studied at from a museum point. To go and see it clap them or at your. We don't like this. We, we thought that when we started this in, uh, started work in the industry, we wanted to make it progressive to the point where everybody appreciated traveling on railways and would like to travel. But this, what with the increased fares on railways, discouraging passengers one way or another, has made things a bit difficult. Some people seem to be of the opinion that uh, all you have to do is to make the railways pay and everybody is happy. I'm afraid they're disillusioned. They haven't seen that the majority of the railway man. Morale is very low. <laughs> Past years we've had butchers, bakers, candlestick makers. They've all had a good at running railways because they've justified themselves as good economists in their particular field. We don't have that today. On the railways today, you can have anybody you like. They'll never satisfy the people unless you get a railway man who infuses that feeling into the people that are working under him that he understands what they're doing. And Mr. Johnson, who is our present chief, he is about the nearest we've had to a railway man come into the industry now. We're hoping that he'll give us a square to deal. Northwards towards Sheffield, where the principal commodities carried are steel and coal in trucks and businessmen in first-class coaches. 
one-tenth of all freight on British Rail starts in the Sheffield Division, where more than 11 million pounds have been spent to bring things up to date in the last few years, and where 7,300 railwaymen work and live. The Sheffield Club is a place where any railwayman can come and bring his wife and children if he likes. The younger men of British Rail drink, play darts or billiards, while the older men of the LNER and LMS, or still further back of the Great Central or Midland Railways, and they still think of themselves like that, drink and talk in the back rooms, remember their old distinctions with pleasure and argue the toss. There was more art. There was more skill, there was more, what shall I say, there was more harmony between the, the two men. The two men there, you had the job to do. And that was where the pride of craft, the pride of craft was there. Well, listen, you've had your, you've had yours there, Jack, just a minute. The steam engine is out of date. Well, we know that, and they don't expect the computer to work. It may be out of date till there's another one, and then it will out of date. No, I'd like that with a little candle harness, and steam engines will come back. A D is live it stops with a defect, it's a dead duck. But a steam engine that's stuck with a, 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 a defect, even the side rod, a yeah. break it in there. You could get out of the way with it in sidings. There weren't the delay, what they used today, two and three hours. You had to clear the main line. You had to clear the main line, clear and you could line do, because you'd side. still got some power. The steam engine is obsolete. Now, I'll give you a case in point, Jack. You'll take every coal train from Sheffield, a single load, <laughs> about 40, 41 coal, <laughs> wouldn't it? Yeah. Right, today, the electric will take more. Well, no, I'm, I'm there's not the you. skill, I don't care a bugger what you say, there's not the skill in driving an electric or a diesel engine as there is in driving a steam oh, train. Yes. Oh, no, You've no, got the unlimited, is, nearly an unlimited power. When they argue the superiority of steam, they don't mean at all that it was more efficient, because they know it wasn't. But steam to them is better because it was a more demanding thing. It was a difficult thing to do well, and they take pleasure in remembering how they did it. And we used to walk in the shed at Mill Houses when I was a, a young engine cleaner. The smell of locomotives, it used to be uh, like a, a, a bit of ozone, you know, the smell of the locomotive. It's like the smell of ozone, beautiful. Yes, I've had some happy times on, uh, on the old steamers. Especially when we used to go down the west of England. We would get the other side, uh, Bromsgrove, it like going in a different country. Especially uh, spring of the year when it got towards approaching Ash Church when all the um, blossom was on the trees, the apple blossom. You could smell it miles away when the wind was in the right direction. Really marvellous. Yes, th those days will never come back again, not for me anyway. Lovely. If I had my time to come over again, I'd, I'd do it again. I loved it. I loved the steam engine. They were smashing. Euston, Britain's newest mainline station, and full of the latest architectural textures. White mosaic, black polished granite, aluminium, glass, reinforced concrete, and blue-black stove enamel steel. And people off to see friends this weekend. Twenty-three acres in all, and in the concourse, plenty of room for 30,000 passengers a day to hurry to and from trains, but no room for anybody to sit. 
There are no seats because British Rail says they would only attract vagrants. The seats in the bars are plastic and hard, and the superloo is sixpence. The only old things are the statues, saved from the famous Great Hall of the old station. The power box, all electric with buttons to push and little switches. Not so real somehow as the heavy signal levers of the Great Central. More like playing with toy trains. The nine hours to Manchester will leave from platform 13. Call Rugby, Stafford, Crew, and Manchester Piccadilly. Meals, light refreshments, and drinks are available on this service. Platform 13 for the nine hours to Manchester. It's not nearly so dramatic or so heroic as the Royal Scot of 40 years ago, but it's a lot cleaner and it's faster. And this is the way railways are going. Today's top expresses can do the 188 miles from Euston to Manchester in as little as 150 minutes. And that, city centre to city centre, is faster than flying. The old goods train can be modern and glossy too. Twice a day, the freight liner ships from Zeebrugge come into the Harwich terminal. The containers are pulled out of the hold, lowered onto lorries, and driven off to be lowered onto freight liner trains. Containerization is a mighty big word, but what it means is that goods are packed into containers all the same size, which can be handled by the same cranes and the same lorries, and loaded onto long trains of the same size trucks. Freightliners only started in 1965, but by next year they hope to have 80 freightliner routes carrying a million containers a year. Five nights a week, around midnight, a freightliner train leaves Harwich for Manchester. It travels at 75 miles an hour and gets in by breakfast time, and there are no stops on the way.
Sheffield, too, has a new way with freight. At the new electronic marshalling yard at Tinsley, the points change by computer tape, and the trucks are guided into one of 53 different sidings. From the spot where they are automatically sorted to the time they enter the right siding, trucks have a quarter of a mile to run. Tiny devices at the side of the rails sense how fast the truck is moving and either break it or give it a boost. Tinsley covers 145 acres. Everything here has been built since 1961. It is one of the most modern and complex marshalling yards anywhere in the world. All this is a long, long way from the railways of 20 years ago. From the railways of 50 years ago, it is an age. I started on railway at six shillings a week as a van boy. Time I was 20, I was getting two pounds a week. I got married and raised a family up on uh, 50 shillings a week. The most you could get was a sh as a shunter, a guard was 65 shillings a week. You know, you've been living on the poverty verge all those years. It's only just this last few years that uh, it's uh, got a lot better and it's worth having now. I will say today, a railway career is worth having today. As a railway man, I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, the bad hours, they had the compensation. I uh, enjoyed them to the full, but there's only one thing, uh, one disagreeable part of this life, it's part your social life, and there, uh, uh, and uh, in consequence, the wife's life was spoiled as well. And I think the damn good women who stick to, loco uh, to uh, locomotive men, you know, I think they're really the salt of the earth for the simple reason that their social life's ruined as well as ours. I've had a good time, you know. I've had a good wife to look after me and that kind of thing. See to me when I got home and keep the kids quiet in the street. That's one of the main things. Go out to Rag and Bone and have a row with them, you know. Clear off, get off, you know. Rags and bones are shouting and, oh, Christ, I'm woke up again. Keep the kids quiet. The kids will come home. Is my dad at work or is he in bed, you know? And that kind of thing. And that was how you were in those days. They, all these chaps, you know, they're the same. They've had the same rotten hours it was. A fellow came up one day selling fish on his fish cart. And I just nicely got to sleep and he shouted, Whoa, you know, I didn't know. Do. I got up to the window and I said, I'll go and break your so and so neck if you don't shut up. <laughs> nicely got off to sleep, perhaps in the middle of the morning. Well, fancy getting home. You, you got home on some of those jobs at 10 in the morning, you see. Missus would be washing. Well, what could you do? If you went to bed, everybody were making her out. Kids were in the yard shouting and screaming and playing about. But after all, I think uh, we all enjoyed ourselves. I think real women, they're a community of their own, you know. You, there's no other job, really, that uh, had the rotten hours to put up with as we had. But by and large, I've had a good time and I've done very well. We used to come from Gloucester with a slow, seven o'clock from Gloucester in the morning, to Birmingham New Street. I used to couple off the train, drop into the the siding, he used to call that siding the parlour. And my mate's job was broaching news, he was to swill the shovel out, get in the parlour, bake a couple of Gloucester eggs in, in the shovel and have a good fry up. And believe me, you can't get a better feed than baking an eggs fried on a shovel. I've, I've cooked steak, kippers, the lot on the old shovel. In fact, the company got a bit old fashioned to it after a bit, they started drilling holes in the shovel so you couldn't use it as a, a frying pan. Uh, yes. Yes, I used to enjoy my breakfast at, uh, at Birmingham New Street at that time of day. Sheffield Bridge Houses, the first terminus of the Sheffield Manchester Railway, is in ruins. The navvies are smashing it up and burning the rubbish and bits and pieces. There aren't any potatoes here anymore, or any engines. Only the bulldozers of the demolition men. This was bridge houses in its glory, with lorries and clutter and cramped tiny buildings. The potato siding in the background 
and the long canopy of the goods station on the left. Bridge Houses was one of four old goods yards in Sheffield. They've all vanished now. The old engineers built to last. They said their works would last a hundred years. And even after 125, the bulldozers have a hard time tearing it all down. to York Express approaches Sheffield. For years, the old Midland Railway was deadly enemies with the patrician London Northwestern, which called itself the Premier Line, to which the Midland, which didn't have the fastest trains or the biggest engines, but generally ran to time, replied that the London and Northwestern might call itself what it pleased, but that the Midland was the best way. This line will remain as one of the railway's profitable north-south routes, serving the south coast, the Midlands, the north and Scotland. Its future is assured. The future of the Sheffield-Manchester line, the old Great Central route through Woodhead, isn't so assured. For some years now, there's been talk of closing the line to passenger trains. What do the men who work the line think of this prospect? Well, if they close this line to passenger traffic, of course it will be a blow to my depot, which will lose several jobs. But I, th I think it would be a crying shame because I think this is one of the best intercity services there is. Nearly an hourly service from each way, and we do the journey in about an hour. I just think it would be a crying shame. In fact, it's now been decided. The passenger service which has run on this line since the first ceremonial train of December 1845 is closing. Freight trains will continue, and a passenger service by another route will still link the two cities. But by January 1970, the last passenger train will have run from Sheffield, Victoria, through Peniston and Woodhead to Manchester. We're approaching Manchester Piccadilly now. It used to be called Manchester London Road, this station, by the way. Dropping down in speed now. It's a dead end station, this, so we have to drop in pretty carefully. A slight touch on the stop locks could probably cause quite a few injuries. Coming into the station now. That's it now. Just about on time. 